My name is Kelsey Fulton, and today I'm going to talk about our research that explores uh, how entertainment media shapes people's perceptions of cybersecurity. So to start, we may ask ourselves, you know, how do people make security relevant decisions? Well, uh, as I'm sure you're all very aware, they draw from something we call their mental models, right? Basically how they perceive and understand um, computer security. But prior research has actually shown that fictional media influences uh, people's mental models. And I'm talking about fictional media that looks a little something like this guy right here. No way. I'm getting hacked. A Portsky? No, no, this is major. They've already burned through the NCIS public firewall. Well, isolate the node and dump them on the other side of the router. I'm trying. It's moving too fast. Oh, this is not good. We're using our connection to the Infus database. Sever it. I can't. It's a point attack. He or she is only going after my machine. It's not possible. This is DOD level 9 encryption. It would take months to get built. Hey. What is that, video game? No, Tony, we're getting hacked. They get in Abby's computer, the entire NCIS network is next. I can't stop him. Do something, McGee. Uh, I've, I've never seen code like this. Oh. Ah, where'd it go, Abby? I didn't do anything. I thought you did. No, I did. As much as we could sit here and watch YouTube clips of NCIS all day, we'll skip that part. All right, um, so as I'm sure all of you are aware, uh, that video is perfectly accurate, right? Um, so as we can see, you know, um, these depictions often span the spectrum of accuracy, some more accurate, some like NCIS, not throwing any shade, a little less accurate. Um, and so if users are watching this and learning from it, um, this could be extremely detrimental, right? And so in order to understand maybe how this media um, is affecting people, we need to understand you know, exactly what are they taking away from these kinds of portrayals. So in order to do this, we want to answer a question like, you know, how are fictional TV shows and movies informing people's perceptions of computer security? Now, that's a very broad question, so in order to do this, we'll break it down a little bit. So first, we want to understand, you know, what are people learning from these portrayals? Um, and then following that, we want to understand, you know, how are these learned concepts actually affecting people's overall mental models of computer security, and in result, their behaviors? And then lastly, um, why are they learning these things in particular, right? Why some things over others? So in order to do this, um, we completed semi-structured interviews. We had 19 participants. And our interviews were kind of broken into um, three sections. The first is the background section, where we kind of got a feel for what people knew coming into this, um, how they defined hacker, things like that, and maybe their personal experiences with being hacked. And then the second section was clips, where we showed them six clips and asked them some follow-up questions. Namely, you know, what do you think happened in this clip? Um, and things like, what did you find realistic? Why? What did you find unrealistic? Why? And then lastly, we followed it with a broad um, questions of like, how do you think fictional media as a whole does with realism related to computer security? Now, once we completed these interviews, um, we used open and axial coding to suss out some themes. So to start, I'm going to go over, you know, what are people learning um, and how these learned concepts are affecting their behavior. So I may be a, being a bit presumptuous by saying, well, look at what are people learning and why they're learning these things. I guess a really good question to start with would be, are people learning from fictional media? Um, and it turns out that they indeed are. We actually had five participants who mentioned media depictions without prompt. Um, so for example, we asked a participant, you know, when I say the word hacker, what do you think of? And their immediate response was, well, I think of Matthew Broderick and War Games. So for those of you who are trying to profile hackers, don't worry, we did it for you. That's exactly what it looks like. Um, three participants also directly mentioned TVs and movies as a source for where they're thinking they're learning these things. Um, and interestingly enough, we actually had people who made references to uh, fictional media who actually thought that the media was inaccurate overall. So for example, we had a participant who said, you know, I think that the media as a whole portrays these things inaccurately. Um, and then they later said, you know, sometimes when they're watching movies or TV, um, they just really kind of accept whatever's being thrown at them. This is the same person who said that they thought it was inaccurate, and yet they're still accepting what's being thrown at them. So this can actually suggest that, you know, people who uh, claim to know better are actually being influenced by these, in addition to people who don't claim to know better. So our results actually suggest a kind of you know, feedback loop where people are learning mental models of security, sometimes from fictional media, um, sometimes from other places, 
but these models are getting reaffirmed when they appear in other media later. So what are people learning from fictional media? Well, um, they're learning that hackers are only targeting either specific people or important people. Um, attacks in unsafe situations are always going to be obvious. Um, encryption is fragile, and all security measures are futile. Um, unplugging the computer and other simple solutions. Um, and suspicious emails can be dangerous. And I'm going to break these all down a little bit. So let's start with only uh, hackers only target specific and important entities. So um, people often thought, you know, hackers are only going to choose important targets. And for example, we had a participant who mentioned, you know, that they indeed weren't important enough to be a target for a hacker, right? Because they don't have any money. Um, and later they connected this when watching a clip when they said, you know, uh, they thought that something was realistic, that the things that they were breaking in that clip were of high security. So as you imagine, very important targets, right? People are also learning that hackers always target a specific person or entity rather than, you know, sending a phishing email, right? Um, and so this is exemplified by someone who said, you know, a target is someone that you might have a personal grudge against. Um, and they later connected this when they said, you know, the fact that one of the clips we showed, they targeted one person at the NSA to get in instead of targeting all of the NSA to get in, uh, that seemed realistic to them. So what are people really taking away from this? Well, they're learning that they don't need to protect themselves because they're not important or they're not, they didn't, aren't specific enough for someone to want to attack them. Um, so they're thinking that they never need to actually protect themselves against a hacker. So people are also learning that attack and unsafe, attacks in unsafe situations are obvious. So oftentimes, um, in fictional TV shows and movies, an attack is portrayed as you know, an, attack, an act of intrusion, as we saw in NCIS, that's going to trigger anomalous behavior, right? Um, and sometimes these can actually include deliberate signatures from a hacker, something along this line here, right? Um, and so this is actually from a clip that we showed, and a participant said, you know, that that seemed realistic to them because the imagery of being hacked, where all the screens flash and stuff, that's what they think hacking looks like. It doesn't look like anything else, that's it. And so why is this a problem? Well, if people are waiting for an obvious indicator of a security problem, oftentimes, as you guys know, they're not going to get one, right? Um, and so they may think that they're safe when indeed they're not. Um, people are also learning that encryption is fragile and all security measures are futile. Um, so oftentimes in, in TV shows and movies, we can see that encryption is quickly and easily broken by sufficiently talented attackers. Um, and so when asked what they thought uh, hackers, what limitations hackers have, they said absolutely none. A participant said that. Um, and they later tied this to a clip when they said, you know, in our day and age, it seemed realistic because in a blink of an eye, you're done, you're not protected. And so people are learning that they shouldn't trust any security measures um, because they're just going to get hacked anyway. And while, you know, if a nation state is after me, sure, no matter what I do, they are going to get into my, uh, my information. That's often not an actual attack model for the everyday person, right? And so if people are thinking they should never protect themselves, um, then they're not preventing the everyday hacker from getting to their sensitive data. So people also felt that unplugging the computer and other simple solutions were a way to solve a problem. Um, for example, as you all saw in the NCIS clip, um, they unplugged the computer at the end to solve the problem, and a participant felt that this was indeed realistic because um, back when they had viruses, I imagine in the 90s, first thing they do is unplug it and see if it worked again, right? Um, and interestingly enough, as you all laughed, um, not a single participant actually noted the use of a single keyboard um, by two people uh, to actively defend against attack. And like, while that's not particularly problematic if they want to go home and try to have two people type on the same keyboard, it's not going to cause a major problem. Um, if they're willing to take representations like this at face value, um, it's going to be, they're really going to be able to un un unable to recognize potentially harmful information. So basically, they're learning that simple solutions can solve potentially serious problems. Lastly, people were also learning that suspicious emails can be dangerous. And now you all may be sitting there thinking, well, Kelsey, that's good. That's what they should be learning. And you're right. Um, not everything portrayed in media is detrimental pe to people's mental models. Um, many participants noted that the phishing in Black Hat was realistic, uh, which is actually portrayed in this photo here. So for those of you who can't see in the back, it's a picture of a um, email that has a downloadable attachment, right? 
And so when asked what about this clip in particular was realistic, you know, our participant said, you always hear about viruses that you can attach to an email, and so you never open attachments unless you know who sent it to you. And so this is great because people are learning that suspicious emails can be dangerous. And this is a proof that we actually can use fictional media to teach people things that will benefit them. So now that we've kind of covered the what and the how, let's dive a little deeper into the why people are picking these things in particular. So how do people evaluate realism? Well, we found that participants often start with a default assumption. Accurate, inaccurate, and not surprisingly, mixed, right? Um, and then they mediate this default assumption by using their own technical knowledge, maybe things they learn from their work or things that they've personally experienced, non-technical backgrounds, so maybe things they heard from other people but things they had experienced in their own, uh, the compliance within the clip with existing folk models, and lastly, the cinematic aspects of the clip. So to start, let's kind of explore the proxy of people using their own technical knowledge to evaluate realism. So first we found that technical jargon usually implies realism to somebody in a clip. So for example, a participant said, you know, when they hear technical terms, so for example, in a clip we showed, it's like a foreign language, and since they have no idea what that means, that's gotta be realistic to them. It sounds technical, so it's gotta be real. Um, but interestingly, this actually wasn't always the case. Um, some participants actually felt that the presence of jargon meant that somebody's trying to pull a bunch of technical terms, throw them into a paragraph, uh, at an attempt to make it sound more realistic than it actually was. Um, we also found that participants felt that if a scene depicted was maybe too fast or too easy, it implied that it wasn't realistic. Um, so oftentimes, you know, it's uh, hacking or defending is uh, portrayed as something that's active and quick and easy, right? Um, and that's always seen as unrealistic to participants, or oftentimes seen as unrealistic to participants. People also use their non-technical background to um, evaluate realism, and basically this is like information or experiences that they personally had that maybe wasn't directly related to the technical knowledge they knew or understand. So first, we found that if it matches with a negative personal experience, it implies realism. Um, so we can see this with a participant who said that a clip was realistic because um, they used a keylogger in the clip and her stepdad had to put a keylogger on her own computer to see if she had Facebook, so that's how she knew it was possible and that made it seem realistic to her. We also found that participants felt that the relatability of a scene implied that it was realistic. For example, if someone could see the scene happening to themselves, then the scene was more realistic to them. So for example, in the black hat clip, someone said, you know, I found this realistic because they probably would have fallen victim to it too, so that made it seem real to them. People also use the compliance within this clip of, with existing folk models to determine whether they seemed that it was realistic. So first, we actually found that the motivation for hacking within the clip uh, influenced the realism. Uh, participants often thought that hackers were motivated by their desire to show off, and so within a clip, we had someone who was they thought it was realistic because the character seemed like she was showing off, and so you know you want to show people what you're good at, and so that made it seem really realistic to them. We also found that any deviation from hacker stereotypes implied a lack of realism. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Black Hat, uh, the main character, uh, a hacker, is indeed played by the handsome Chris Hemsworth, and somebody said that that was unrealistic because Chris Hemsworth is just too darn good looking to be a hacker. Um, interestingly enough, uh, oftentimes when asked what they found realistic, uh, participants would just say that, you know, hacking happens. It's a plausible thing, I hear about it, it's something that can happen. And so just by depicting hacking within a scene, that made it seem realistic to them. And lastly, uh, participants viewed rep repeated tropes as a way to imply realism. So we showed two clips that had an idea of siphoning money, or one clip that had an idea of siphoning money, for the reason that somebody did it, and somebody felt that that was realistic because they had seen it in another plot before. People also use cinematic aspects uh, within a clip to determine whether the clip seemed realistic to them. So first, uh, we found that visual and audio cues affect realism, not surprisingly, and participants were actually often split on whether things like Hollywood hacking indicated realism or a lack thereof. Character behavior also had an effect on realism, um, so for example, as you guys saw in the NCIS clip, um, one of the main characters was eating a sandwich and was very lackadaisical about the fact that they were uh, being attacked. And a participant said, you know, 
that was just too casual. It didn't seem realistic because the guy was eating a sandwich, enjoying some lunch, saying what's going on. Um, and so to them, that implied that it wasn't realistic. He should have been taking it more seriously. We also found that incongruity reduces realism. And so what I mean by that is participants, if they perceive something in a scene as being random, or it seemed out of place to them, um, that implied a lack of realism. So with all this information in mind, we make some recommendations. So there's a need for collaboration, which is easy to say, but we actually aren't the first field to look at how entertainment media affects people's understanding and knowledge. Um, the medical field actually did this. And that was the inspiration partially for this project. Um, and so the medical field was looking at whether if you showed positive and accurate representations within the media, if it would influence people and uh, teach them correct things. It turns out it did. Um, and so now there's a position in Hollywood to advise uh, TV shows and movies uh, on the information that they're handing out. So why can't we do that? Um, Hollywood also needs to entertain responsibly. That's easier said than done, and I understand that. Um, but now that we kind of know what people see as realistic and unrealistic with entertainment value involved, um, they could potentially cue for seriousness. You know, the, the whole two keyboard, two people on one keyboard thing, not that detrimental, but we could maybe cue for information that could actually be detrimental to let people know, you know, don't take this seriously um, or do take this seriously. And lastly, educators can actually use tropes and entertainment to their advantage. So it's easy to stand here and say, you know, make more entertaining educational material. But it's not necessarily that. If we know what people assume, like if we know that, for example, you can't have someone good looking be a hacker, um, we can use these kinds of tropes to our advantage, right? So if I can take maybe a not so negative trope, but use it to teach somebody about something more important, then we can benefit from that. So to wrap up, um, our results suggest a kind of feedback loop where mental models, maybe created by media, maybe not, are reinforced when they're later seen in media. And people are indeed learning a variety of things from fictional media, but the good news is it's not all bad things. People often start with a default assumption and then they use technical, personal, and cinematic proxies to then mediate this default assumption. And lastly, we could potentially form a cybersecurity task force, make pretty cool t-shirts, right? Um, to help Hollywood produce more accurate media that is at least still entertaining to the general population. And with that, I will take any questions. Hi, Gus Andrews. My other field is media literacy, as it happens, which is a similar one there. Um, one of the things that we look to when we think about cinematic uh, influence is often um, sort of structural things like camera angle, speed of cuts, music, um, things like that. And you're seeing a lot of this here. You're seeing the fast cuts. You're seeing far angles, close angles. Did anybody refer to any of those, or is that sort of beyond their uh, awareness? Yeah, so great question. Um, they actually didn't refer to like camera cuts or anything, but we did have people mention like dramatic music. Um, which you usually use to escalate a scene, right? Uh, people often perceive that as being unrealistic, um, I guess because when you get a virus on your computer at home, like there's not some pop in like background music playing, right? But um, people often stated that the ex escalation of music to go along with the plot seemed unrealistic to them, yes. Hi, um, I'm Bucky from the University of British Columbia. Um, this was very interesting to um, watch. I was just wondering, how did you avoid priming participants? Was it like in the maybe the title of your recruitment notice, or because I, from my understanding, they made their point after watching the clips and all of that. So how did you avoid priming them in terms of their responses? Sure, yeah. So when we recruited, we recru uh, advertised it as a computer and internet study, which is about as vague as you can go, and the IRB will still approve it. Um, and so we didn't really ask them explicitly about security experience coming in. We did ask them, like, how much time do you spend on each medium? Like, podcasts, TV, movies, to make sure we had a diversity in uh, hours that they spend watching media. Um, and then we just kind of broadly started asking them questions about hackers, their personal experiences. Um, and by the time we got about halfway through the clips, I guess they started to pick up on that we were looking for realism or lack thereof. But we emphasized a lot of the time, too, that there were no right or wrong answers. And we were generally interested in what they had to say. Um, and so that was, that was basically the approach we took. Uh, hi, my name's Connor from uh, Berkeley. Uh, great talk, thanks a lot. Um, do you have any plans to look into the effect of journalism media 
for uh, people's understanding of cybersecurity practices where if they read something in a newspaper, they expect it to be true, but if it's inaccurate, then it's giving them a, a false sense of security? Um, great question. Uh, this is actually uh, completely unrelated to my dissertation interests. This was a project I did uh, that <laughs> was a lot of fun to do. But, um, and so there was no immediate plans to look into to other mediums, but something we did discuss was a major limitation of our work is we just looked at TV shows and we just looked at movies. What about books? What about podcasts? What about journalism, right? Um, what about regular news on TV? How are all these influence, things influencing it? And it's definitely a, a good place for future work that we just don't have plans right now to explore.